I am a technological Oh, this is great, Brian. Thank you. Really appreciate you taking the time to meet. Um, how how did you weather the storm out there last two weeks back? Uh, well, we lost all phone and internet for about a day and a half. Yeah, and that is why you didn't uh, connect with us, and I apologize. But it oh, came oh, across okay. exactly when you and I talked. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it, it was a pretty epochal, but we're two ridges away from where the damage was, so we're okay. Right, right. So we're as far as we can be, back to normal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just reading a T.C. Boyle short story about walking between the raindrops, and he was described. Oh, that's man. He lives 200 yards from me. Yep, I think. Have you met him? No, I haven't. Don't. So I shouldn't say it. He, 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 he's either your taste is not, and I'm not the his sort of writing. Yeah. <laughs> if you're interested, uh, Oprah lives within a mile, and so do Megan and Harry. So we have the whole damn lot. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. No, this is a, uh, a lot of Hollywood people end up within a, a mile of us here. Mm -hmm. By accident in a very wealthy enclave of Santa Barbara by exactly 150 yards. So yep. we don't really belong. Right. And what what is it that, that brought you to Santa Barbara? You had you had started in Cambridge, is that right? I but started my career, well, I went to university in Pembroke College, Cambridge, which was the best thing that ever happened to me. I got a BA there, an MA you get automatically in England. And then I went to Africa, to Zambia. I was offered a job at a museum in what was then Northern Rhodesia and is now Zambia. And I was there for six years and did an external PhD at Cambridge, which was just sending in the document. And um, then I went for a year to East Africa on a project there, which was a disaster. And then I, by chance, got a visiting professorship, University of Illinois in Champaign, which was a bit of a radical change for me. Um, and then by chance, I got a, a chance to have the interview here at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And I ended up staying here 36 years and I retired 17 and a half years ago. Oh, okay. So uh, that's- I'm that's, 86, so I've been around. <laughs> that's, that's part of what cut you loose to be such a prolific author? I still am. <laughs> You, I'm you, still writing books. You're retired, but you're you're one of the most. No, no, academics never retire. I yeah. retired as far as teaching or sitting on committees was concerned, yeah. but I still do a lot of uh, when there's no COVID, a lot of lecturing. I was in Phoenix last week giving a lecture or two lectures, and then um, writing a book about every couple of years. So I'm busy. And what what were you lecturing on in Phoenix? <laughs> Believe it or not, I was lecturing at the Arizona Botanic Garden, which is a fabulous organization. It's very, very good. And I was lecturing about climate change, but not much about deserts. Mm -hmm. uh, small, small groups, two small groups. It was great fun. They were very nice and very yeah. helpful. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. I do a lot of that. Some pretty bizarre audiences, too. What 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 inspired you to write this latest book, the Climate Chaos book? This I'm really enjoying it. It's it's oh, a good. great latest read that I'm digging into. Uh, definitely have some specific questions. I just wanted to start with hearing a little about you know what yeah what is it that inspired you to write this latest book, the Climate well, Chaos? What happened was that back in the early two thousands, I wrote. Was it four, maybe five books on climate change? Right. One, The Little Ice Age, The Long Summer, which is probably the best known. That one got me on to John Stewart's Daily Show, which was quite an experience. Yeah. And then I wrote a book uh, called The Attacking Ocean on Rising Sea Levels. Uh -huh. and then, hmm? I, I, was, I was just uh, saying, yeah, I remember that title. Yeah. And then I wrote... Uh, a book on water and then after that I got into other things and then a friend of mine who's 
knows a lot about archaeology and climate, said, why didn't I update my books with a new book, which brought all the new research in? Because there's been this enormous tidal wave of very, very good basic research into climate change over mm -hmm. the past 15 years. Yeah. And I wrote a proposal and 15 publishers re re rejected it, largely because I think there are too many books out there on climate change at the moment, most mm -hmm. of which prophesy Armageddon, and that gets awfully tired. And mm -hmm. I eventually got a contract to, to, to write the book, uh, and it turned out that it was quite a job because there had been a massive change, particularly in basic climatology and also in historical environmental history, which is a really burgeoning field, much more so than archaeology, actually. And there were several absolutely superb books on things like the Little Ice Age and so on, which enabled me to produce a new global synthesis, mm -hmm. which to my astonishment has been quite well received. So, mm -hmm. very well received. so um, this is my last word on climate, and I'm not going to write any more books on it. <laughs> well, a couple of the sections I wanted to ask you some questions about that I particularly enjoyed. I like the um, th this part early on where you're talking about the Sasanians and how they salinize the desert. Yep. Around, um, I believe it's, uh, you were saying they did, uh, they carried water more than 2,300 kilometers to the Tigris and the scheme irrigated about 8,000 square kilometers of farmland. Yeah, they, were, they were on a big scale. Right, they were on a big scale. And then how it basically in part to simplify what you get, what you get into there, it, it basically mm -hmm. failed due to that scale not being well thought out or well planned? Not well planned, number one. Number two, given it was a pre-industrial civilization, yeah. which relied mainly on human hands or animals, um, it was very difficult to keep mm -hmm. standards, particularly of drainage, because the key thing about irrigation in environments like that is being able to drain the water off so you don't get the salinization effects. Right. And a yeah. lot of it was just the sheer scale of it and the administration of it. When a major decision had to be made for the sake of argument in Iran, it probably took three or four months at least for an urgent decision to get back, minimum, as it did in the British Napoleonic Wars, for example. Yeah. And a lot of this was logistic. They were very efficient. And of course, they didn't have the environmental knowledge that we do much of which is based on sophisticated science. You know, I particularly appreciate in this book, The Intimate Bond. Oh. This one I've, I've enjoyed, especially your, what I found enlightening was the amount of detailed description, the, the way you bring to light these, the transportation modes, I find to be particularly mm -hmm. the, the attention you're paying to the modes of transport. This one, one of the things that really intrigued me was the way you described those um, those routes that the Egyptians took through the deserts and how the how the donkeys were determining the distance of where the water caches were stashed and how that was determining maximum travel time that could be, you know, that could be spent in that environment and how that was creating a whole pattern of basically how these cultures interacted with their geographies that, that I even come across other writers who have done such a good job of giving what I think is a, a really good picture of what what are some of the unique characteristics of life in ancient times that you wouldn't you wouldn't at first hand you know um, understand or even know about without looking into the archaeology of them no, actually, it's fascinating you mentioned that example, because in the last six months, there seems to be a resurging interest in donkeys as mm. 
a powerful tool in history. My goodness me, they were, and they're very inconspicuous. <laughs> but the logistics right. of donkeys as opposed to camels yeah. are really formidable because you've got to have a hell of an infrastructure behind these very, fairly modest loads these guys could carry across the desert. And mm -hmm. they did it. And a lot of it was careful water carrying and storage. And I think for every beast, you had at least one, if not two beasts, just carrying water. Mm. Right, oh. right. Indeed. No, these were the things that made that book fun. Writing and about these details, like wolves and things like that. And I particularly like the the theme of this this book, how it seems you you're coming back to some without without dwelling on them, you're you're looking at this question of what does it mean to live sustainably? What does it mean to adapt mm -hmm. to extremes? How are these civilizations panning out in terms of the the stressors that have been recurring throughout history, especially drought, with the focus on on drought, but also monsoons. It seems are both um, players in the stage when you're outlining what are some of the determining factors in the the resiliency of these civilizations, and and then offering some pointers without trying to be determinist about how these. Uh, could be indicators of what are what are some good ideas that we could be picking up on in our present times. Oh yes, and yeah. what is absolutely fascinating is certainly in archaeological circles, I have been accused of being a neo-determinist, yeah. <laughs> adopting these ideas, which is nonsense. Right. Because if you want to think about climate change, I always, when I give a lecture on it, I show a picture of a still pond, and then I show a picture of a pebble falling in the pond and the rings that radiate from it, which eventually become calm. Those rings, social, economic, political changes, whatever, are really what are the consequences of climate change, far more than just a big storm or an El Nino. The effects mm -hmm. of an El Nino go on for years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, I really appreciate that at the beginning, how you got into the mechanisms of climate and gave a really, you know, the uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation. I found a lot of your description of those weather patterns also to be really just accessible and important to understand the scope and scale of the patterns of, of uh, weather on the planet and, and these cycles, these rhythms of how, you know, deep ocean currents along with larger weather cycles. Thank you, that, that was the purpose. The, the, the big trouble with writing about climate change, talking about climate change, teaching climate change, is the extent to which you delve into the technical climatology. Mm -hmm. I am scientifically basically illiterate. I never had any of it in school or university. And this gives me the interesting perspective of trying to understand it. But fortunately, there have been people around who made an effort to really make sure that people understood the basics, which the most famous, of course, is the North Atlantic Oscillation and mm -hmm. then the Pacific one. The, Whatever they forget, what the hell is yeah. it? And, and, and so and El Nino so, and so, yeah, and so yeah, yeah. No, but those those are terribly fundamental. You understand that the, we are at their mercy and they're Ill, irregular in their arrival and departure. I mean, mm -hmm. are we going to get a El Nino next year, or is the La Nina going to continue? Right, it's all up in the air when it'll continue. You know, I mean that's just the way. But it's funny, as you were saying that, I wanted to say about the science that one of my favorite books for teaching my daughter and teaching homeschoolers about the Ice Age is this one that you've done, um, that the complete Ice oh, Age. That, oh, that, yeah, that's a compilation. Yeah, yeah, that, that really just one of the best books for me as a teacher when I want to make the mm -hmm. Ice Age something that people understand why is this important and how to begin to 
break it into a pattern that has some kind of uh I feel it's really essential for understanding broader perspectives of who we are and where we are on the planet. And that if, without the story of our evolution um, from this earlier viewpoint, I think we end up with a, a very um, sort of uh, truncated view of human society and human life ways, meaning that we know that you know, in terms of time spent in the present uh, physiological and conceivably psychological form that we're in predates civilization, so-called civilization, by many tens of thousands of years. And so to me, it's a very important narrative to be able to help readers, help people in the world today to be able to have a sense of identity that's connected to what you know, what we might call a deeper time, rather mm-hmm. than a sense of time that's just very kind of surface. You know, um, I mean, a lot of my background, fortunately, as a kid growing up in high school, I had a, a private tutor in Latin and ancient Greek, and I thought a lot about um, longer ago time periods than I realized most kids my age ever thought about. They didn't grow up thinking about in the eighties and nineties even the classics were starting to fade in the U.S. as an educational focus. And even thinking about, you know, the Persians or the Babylonians or um, understanding that there were time periods in human history that are before these larger, um, in a sense, more recent manifestations of civilization, that civilization uh, has, has long roots and that we have long roots. And the way we've been shaped by Ice Ages, and you're writing about that, I find to be some of the best writing and some of the most accessible because of the way you bring in the anthropology and you bring in the archaeology in such a way where it also gets blended, especially in this complete Ice Ages with Earth science. And it's that it's that combining of those that I think is is a really important way for us to, at a cultural level, think about who we are and think about what is our relationship to evolution and to time on the planet. Oh, how right you are. I had a high school teacher who was a real expert on Homer. He knew the whole of the Odyssey by heart in Mm -hmm. Greek and English. And he inculcated me a love of that, Mm -hmm. which is still with me. And he died when I was in university. And 300 people, mostly his former students, turned up for his funeral in Oxford because the man who ran it was one of the, the professor of classics in Oxford, or uh, of Latin, was one of his students, or Greek. And this guy recited Helen's Lament over Hector in Greek. Mm-hmm. Without the notes at the funeral, there wasn't a dry eyes in the place because he, he acted it, and you wow. realize what the legacy was, and that's the legacy. It is. Yeah. It's stupid to say that the past is irrelevant to today. It's not. It's utterly relevant. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people in the world today who are still living from one harvest to the next. Mm-hmm. It's brutal, and yeah. we don't understand that. Nor do we understand or make an effort to understand the extraordinary reservoirs of knowledge about the environment, about farming, about herding, about fishing that is residing in many societies that is still hovering on the edge of Mm -hmm. subsistence hunting, subsistence agriculture, and so on. This is one of the great failings, in my humble opinion, of anthropology, although there are notable exceptions. There's a lot we haven't done to yeah. serve. It's too late now almost, which is mm-hmm. tragic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you know some of the, uh, I want to stick with your book, but I can't resist going off on some other side tangents that I want to explore with you as far as um, some other authors and their writings that I wonder about your familiarity with. Do you know uh, this guy, Alan Colada, who wrote some books about the Ayamara? 
And you know, I know of him. I don't know him personally. Right. You know of his work. Yes. Yeah. So that's a little bit of, you know, this whole idea of applied archaeology. You're familiar mm -hmm. with this, this term? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a, a major factor in uh, the archaeology of northern Bolivia, for example, on Lake Titicaca, where they have actually reconstructed traditional potato fields yeah. using the local people plus archaeology. Uh, no, this is a hard subject. Yeah. And that's the exact example I was thinking of, because that he talks about that in his book, Valley of the Spirits, that he wrote about the Ayamara. And it yeah. also had pulled down one of one of the books about Tiahuanaku, because I find that site so fascinating as another of the ancient sites that weathered, it looks like also some extreme drought time periods. Have I'm, you been there? No. No. If you have a chance, go. That's one of the sites you should see. Another one is Angkor Wat in Cambodia. If you miss that, you're crazy. It is so big yeah. and dramatic. And this is apart from all the obvious ones. You know, they're really worth seeing. How about this one called the, uh, have you ever heard of this one in India? I sure, I'm sure you have. Kailas, the Alora Caves? No. No? no. This, this site. There is a considerable gap in my knowledge. Yeah. My regret, although I've been there. I'll send you an interesting link about after our conversation. It's another one of these ones that, like Gobekli Tepe, it kind of has gotten a little bit of, um, you know, people who are more just trying to make outlandish theories talk about it. And unfortunately, not as much good archaeology. It's tough to find good archaeology on the site, actually. It's like easy to find all kinds of, of what I consider sort of wacko material you know like graham hancock which is getting lots of <laughs> oh yes no I mean, there's a peculiar and a long history of pseudo archaeology as it's being called the right. lost continent of atlantis for example all yeah. is garbage yeah um, and that doesn't do anybody any good although you must say that graham hancock is a vivid writer and he can sell you anything and people believe it Exactly. And as somebody who peruses pretty much anything I come across that's related to these topics, I've dug into his tome called Fingerprints of the Gods. In the footnotes of that book, I found some really excellent source materials that I read um, about, you know, the origin of potatoes. This guy, John Reeder, um, are you familiar with his writings at all? Oh, John, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you like it. Yeah, I like his writing. He He did a really early one I appreciated that was called Man on Earth, a little bit dated in its language title-wise. Did he not write a book on Africa? He may have. He may have done, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But he did another one just called Potato. That's yeah. really, really... That came out fairly recently, I think. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. No, I haven't read that yet. I'm heavily involved when you're dealing with hunting, you're not dealing with potatoes. <laughs> when you're dealing with hunting, is that what you said? I'm writing a history of hunting at the moment. Oh, okay. Awesome. That's great. That's a great topic. Mm -hmm. Where is that take? Mm -hmm. Where are you gonna have to go on some travels to do some research for that? I've done the traveling over the years, you know. Now, filing. Um, I've even been out with a man stalking antelope who was armed only with a flintlock musket, believe it or not, in mm -hmm. Africa. He missed. <laughs> but I learned how to stalk because when you've got a gun like that or a spear, you have to get 10 feet away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, you can do it. Yeah. yeah. Now, I learned a lot. Of, and my time in Africa was enormously valuable because yeah. I learned a lot there. And I knew Richard Lee, who was the big man on Bushman. I knew him very well, or the San, as they're now called. Mm -hmm. A lot of this I'm. Uh, have done and uh, where my big learning curve is on things like the slaughter of the bison and the Great Pains and people like Fred Nick Courtney Salou the Victorian hunter who was an incredible human being he went to the same high school I did believe it or not um, and I'm learning all that which is a huge literature I'm very tired of reading about Humber's house already <laughs> excuse me oh, yeah. you know, Three elephants <laughs> then had lunch and went and played tennis, you know. These uh, yeah. 
<laughs> it's a fascinating subject. Very difficult. I've got a lot more work to do. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, you know, one of the early, early books that I had read was this, do you know this guy, Daniel Hillel? Yeah. He wrote yeah. this book about civilization and soil. And that was <laughs> the first book that I came across the Salinization history of the Babylonians and the Sumer and how Salinization in general in the Tigris Euphrates is a challenge that is uh, kind of endemic to those soils. The literature is so enormous, I, you can't give up. There's a very good book that came out about two years ago, three years ago, um, on, I think it was crops or seeds, which was excellent. I forget seeds, the name. yep, seeds, that's right. That one I'm listening to. Some of them that I don't have time to read, I just listen to them. This which guy one? is really, very authoritative and knows his stuff. Because the great thing is a lot of the, the big thing that's happening now is that we're not talking about archeology span anymore. We're talking about the study of humans as a multidisciplinary enterprise. And that means climate, geology, genetics is the hot thumb at the moment. Every time you read a new literature, they've changed everything, but it's mm -hmm. always very fascinating. Yeah. And yeah. multidisciplinary history as well, I guess I'm spending my time now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And thoroughly enjoying it. Because yeah, you really have to write well for that literature. <laughs> this, is a, this is a fun one by this woman, Annalie Novitz. She wrote a book called Scatter, Adapt, and Remember. And she's basically looking at um, Angkor Vat, um, you know, Chahadahoya. Cahokia and um, and Pompeii. When did that come out? This this is from um, twenty twenty one. Hmm. Never heard of it. Ha cities have been a hot topic. Um, yeah, Atahualpa is an extraordinary site. Right. Uh, some of the finest archaeology I've ever seen. It's amazing stuff. And yeah. there, you really get a sense of the reality of living in a very clouded, crowded community with very little sanitation, endemic right. disease, conflict, the whole bit. And Ian Hodder is absolutely fabulous. Right. He's wonderful. Yeah, they say five to 8,000 people live there continuously for 1,500 years. Yes, and boy, did they have troubles. And a lot of the troubles are sort of echoed in uh, today's world, you know, crowded social tensions but his latest stuff is fascinating because a lot of it now is concerned with the issue of place mm -hmm. live in a place and develop great loyalties to it uh, and things like that you know um, and it's fascinating very new Chahad um it seems like one of the topics that I've had trouble getting attention paid to it in Hodder's work is this uh, the transition from wild cattle and their ritualistic relationships with the wild cattle in the paintings on the walls and to the domestication of cattle. And this, this transition happens at Chahadahoyo, it's a site where it happens in all sorts of places. Right, but there, but we have a particularly, it seems like, um, like an opportunity to look at what was that transition like, what was going on with the population's relationship at that time with the cattle at Chahadahoyo. It would stretch your view here a bit. Um, I think what you need to do is look at an area, and this area is central and southeast Turkey. Because mm -hmm. there are these extraordinary sites, which are earlier than Atalhuyuk. Um, there's one called Gobekli Tepe. Right. Which is yeah, one to ask. Right. Then there are others whose names I can't remember. They mm -hmm. all have unpronounceable names. But there, they are beginning finally to look at, was Gobekli just a shrine or was it a place where people lived? 
And it appears to have been a place where people live. But mm -hmm. if you look at cattle and you look at wild cattle, you're yeah. looking at two very different things. I mean, Bos primogenius, the big aurochs, which yeah. were on the walls of cattle herd, was a very nasty beast indeed and very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It became a subponic uh, personification of hunting skill, of courage, mm -hmm. and leadership. The domestic ox was property. They were domesticated and people owned their cattle. And that radically changed, A, the position of cattle, and B, society. Because mm -hmm. you were tied to the land, you were tied to your beasts, and right. your surplus males became very important social currency for weddings, for gifts, mm -hmm. and so on. The whole mm -hmm. thing changed and changed pretty vastly. Mm -hmm. And the only continuity that continued was in the final, and I'm grossly simplifying here, was the notion of ancestors. Mm -hmm of those that came before, the assumption that life would continue. And this course got upset by the coming of agriculture and the ties to the land. Mm -hmm. But if you look as I did, the Zambezi Valley farmers and lived among them, their devotion to the ancestors was unspoken, but it was there. And when mm -hmm. you died, your spirit went out in the bush and they would hold sometime after you died an all-night ceremony, and they drum your spirit back into the village. It was powerful. Mm -hmm. Doesn't forget things like that, because there's a sort of cycles of seasons, birth, life, and death, and there were cycles of life, and right. the two tie together. Yeah. Very interesting stuff. Um, not much looked at, because everyone's been possessed by the, how do you identify a domestic animal from a... Um, a wild one, which has now pretty well been sorted out. Yeah. Uh, but they haven't really done a lot of thinking about cattle. Some of the best thinking about cattle uh, was done in the 30s mm. by Evans Pritchard, a famous anthropologist. Oh, sure. Yep. Yep. Who did a fabulous job because he really lived among the new era of the Sudan, who are now much dispersed. Many of them live in Nebraska, believe it or not. Mm. And, um, he showed how powerful their devotion to animals was. It was. It was a, an obsession. Mm -hmm. They owned them. You didn't own Bostrom Magenius. You stalked it, you trapped it. And again, you're into this business of hunting really close. Right. Yeah. You really have to get, to really slaughter animals like that, you have to get firearms. Mm -hmm. One of the things about, um, this wild ox was that they became rare, but they didn't come extinct until I think it was 1627 in Poland. They were around. Wow. They were, they were nasty beasts. There are, there are histories of these around, but yeah. they are um, mag they're magnificent horns. They're superb animals. They've tried to reconstruct them, and in fact, are getting pretty close to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Poland, I think, and places like that. Fascinating animal. There, there's, there was a eastern bison pre-colonial contact that was apparently hunted to extinction during the first century of colonization. In that North was, America? Yep, on the east coast, there was an eastern bison. There was an eastern bison. It was hunted out pretty quick. But what its relationship was to the bison in the plains, I don't know. I think it was pretty close. Yeah, yeah. How about this time period, the Ubayid? Southern, mm -hmm. Southern Mesopotamia, approximately 5,800 to 4,000 BC. Does that sound right to you? That, that time period, do you know this guy? Um, I made sure I had all my books sitting around. You know, you know this guy, Scott McCarran? Yeah. Now, fascinating. I learned a lot of stuff in his Origins of Civilization series. I saw you did one for these folks, great courses. You did one on the dawn of civilization, or at least they published it under their great courses. Yeah, it's one of the here. Um, you did this one. Oh yeah. Yep. I didn't realize they printed it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that book is that is way out of date. Right. 
but a lot of the information and again it's that it's the narrative thread that i appreciate that you're doing because you go from prehistory to early settlement and that particular time period is the time period i'm fascinated by it's interesting because i get a constant stream of letters why did you say this on page 86 oh. i have more <laughs> fan letters from people who've watched my great courses than anything else i've ever done you interesting mean? oh wow yeah they're good i mean what i do as a student that i think is really important is you take notes and really pay attention because it's easy to watch or listen to things and have it just go in one and out the other and you don't like what do you retain when you're just <laughs> have you listened to any of the music ones they're fabulous no <laughs> they got some by experts where a guy will take beethoven and they'll dissect the mood he was in when he wrote it's lovely stuff yeah little extracts it's really beautifully done yeah people who make their living of writing for these people i wrote them and i've had no contact with them ever since i get a check occasionally but that's it right so so this historian scott mccarran who teaches at bowden he's out of calgary i think is where he he got his phd and he studied also in um university of calgary phd in archaeology he also studied in um or did dissertation work in cameroon chad nigeria Kenya. Oh, I've heard of him. Yeah, I know who he is. Yes. I think I finally met him, actually. He, what I really like about his perspective that's similar to, he's very academic in wanting to constantly pull back from saying, we, we know what exactly constitutes civilization. He also spends a lot of time talking about how in archaeology, this term chiefdom is overused to describe Oh God, that word. Yeah. <laughs> but he's the first who I heard say that this time period, this Ubayid time period, and Mohenjo Daro and Kado Shahadohoya are apparently all characterized as having no ceremonial center, no hierarchical structure. Um Hodder apparently calls Shahadohoya aggressively egalitarian at one point. And I wondered what what you thought about this this um, this viewpoint. What's the accuracy in it? You know, um, very fashionable at the moment. Yeah, you read or come across this this guy um, Wingro and Graeber, the big book. Yeah, I wondered if you'd read that one too, Dawn of Everything, or or were familiar. Yeah, Volvo, will you? What yes, I have. I wrote a seventeen page review of it. Oh, okay. Colleague, we dissected it. Um, where, where, where would I be able to find that? The book or the review? What's that? The book or the review? Okay. No, which you want? The book or the review? The review. I I've read. I can send you a copy of it. Yeah, please do. If you give me your email again, I'll. I've got it somewhere. But yeah, you've got it. It's in the Zoom. If you send it to the one that I sent this link on. That'd be okay. great. I'll, I'll look it up. I've got it somewhere. But that has been widely read. We were no, that we made the point that they'd done a great deal of research. Yeah. The problem with the book ultimately is it has an agenda. Mm -hmm. And what is being egalitarian anyhow? They absolutely have a point. Mm -hmm. Um early urban society is very much more egalitarian than they are now for a number of reasons. One is um, there just weren't so many people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I mean, really, this is a much more fair because a great deal was done in small groups. Right. That was very fundamental. And then they've got a lot of stuff on there, which is sort of Marxist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, the, the research is oddly patchy, some of it's superb. And where the hell they found some of this stuff, I don't know. Then look at the other stuff where they say, well, so and so produced the theory. And this, of course, is nonsense. And they move on. Right. Yeah. It's a bigger subject. Uh, I'm amazed the book has done as well as it has and been as widely read. I yeah. think we're due for a new look at the theory, but I don't think it's a dramatically new one. Mm -hmm. Right. No, this is, they're riding on that fashion. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. But this guy's this guy's 
take on it, this is from 2010, this McCarran lecture where he's going into the Ubayid being um, what he calls an egalitarian time period where there's- no, I agree with that. It's a very yeah. strange which yeah. was coming at times. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, no. But when you start talking about Harappa and Mahenjadaro, or you yeah. talk, then you're talking about a much bigger scale of things. Right. And you've got a degree of spiritual separation there, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. With Mo and and the other issue, forgive me, which no. is if you were building huge flood control works, irrigation on a large scale, blah, 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 you have to control people. Mm -hmm. An awful lot of stratified society developed from the need to control commoners. Right. That, that's in, that's in, uh, a thesis going way back that irrigation based civilizations precipitated legal. Yes, but right? not a that's uh, a very simplistic view, just right. everything's irrigation. But right. it, it was things like that, building the pyramids, for God's sake. Right. Or um, building the settlement, the citadel at Mahanjadaro. Yeah. It's a big thing, very much bigger than Patalhoyok. But Mohan Jodaro, you were saying in, in this in climate chaos that um, that from your your assessment here is that they they also that they had no um, religious center. Is that right? They didn't have elaborate temples like um, say the Parthenon or something like that. But right. they did have areas where people with spiritual powers lived and mm -hmm. talked to people. That was, they were people who were separate. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on. Mm -hmm. you go from there and the ceremonial centers come in and they, who inherits your title, your powers, mm -hmm. do they inherit them or do they acquire them by force or by marriage? You've got all those complicated issues. The trouble with a lot of the stuff is that it's intangible. It's gone. We don't know. And archaeology doesn't really deal, it deals much more with the material. Right. There's another interesting take that McCarran had about Crete and the Minoans. He talks about how archaeologists until recently focused on the uh, more elaborate, you know, in effect, in effect, fancy big stone remnants oh, and they don't, don't end up digging around in the you know, in the refuse piles of where the poor folk live, so to speak. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, the what first... What fascinates me, actually, is that they, this guy wrote these books, or well, these people did off my work. Uh-huh. And that, that raises serious issues of copyright. But that's my problem. The, who, who's borrowing from it in particular? That Karen or whatever his name is. Oh, yeah. Based on the course. I don't know if the publisher really has the right to do that. I'm sure he does. But yeah, I'm. I'm not sure, or if how much of it's simultane, you know, simultaneity. I'm not sure where, how many different ways, you know, you can come to. Have see. you seen uh, the book that I wrote with a very good Englishman called Chris Scar, called Ancient Civilizations? Have you come across that? No. Mm -mm. You should. Yeah. It's, I shouldn't say this, but this book, do I have a copy here? I probably do if I look on. This book is a college text on oh. ancient civilizations, which we wrote. We just got a new edition out last year. And this has been not much reviewed, but widely used because it is an authoritative view, very really even balanced one of what happened mm -hmm. um, and we do everything from the Sumerians up to Angkor Wat. My colleague Chris Carr is really good and he did all the stuff we're talking about. Oh, um, great. I did the other. I, I, I see if I can find it. Would you mind if I got up for a moment? Because no, no, I get some water, take a break and then we'll... Oh no, no, I just want to find this book. Okay. Yeah. I'll be, won't be more than two months. Okay. Take your time, yeah. Oh no, I see it. It's here. I had it out. I was <laughs> referring to my own book. 
published by Routledge. Okay, yeah, they do great stuff. <laughs> Don't write for them. No, is it challenging? <laughs> Not when you say it in public. But, uh, right. Issues with editors. Yeah. Don't worry, I'll edit that out. <laughs> no, 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 my, my editor is old. Yeah. But, ancient civilization. No, I mean, yeah, it's called ancient civilizations. The latest edition, this is the fifth edition. Been around a while. It is very authoritative, largely thanks to Chris Scar, um, and will give you a good summary. And it is, as far as I know, archaeologically up to date. Yeah, that sounds great. Don't indulge in a great deal of speculation. That is not our job. There is a very good book on cities by a lady. I think her name is Smith. I forget, but uh, Emily is very good. But this is um, probably this, this is the most comprehensive book on ancient civilizations anywhere. But it's a serious upper division undergraduate text. Right. That looks great. I'm going to look. I've just, I've just withdrawn from it because I'm retiring. And um, there's a Mayanist called Charles Golden involved now, who is really good. Mm. But it's a very, and there were good chapters, a thorough chapter on the background as to what these things are, um, you know, which is probably worth having a look at. Yeah, I, think I would send you a copy, but I don't have any. No, that's <laughs> generous of you. I'll, I'll look. This I wanted to get back to this section here where you're talking about the Mohenjo-Daro. It seems like you you get into some details about resilience here that I particularly like, where you're talking about how um, the Indus civilization was robust because it was based on a rural social and economic underpinning that was by its very nature resilient and sustainable in part because the environment was so challenging and diverse and perhaps also because of the seemingly peaceful ideology with its lack of social hierarchy or constraining religious dogma. Correct. And I like this where you said this worked well in a decentralized society where much social authority remained local. Cities were temporary adaptations. I think that's a really unique view that we don't often have is this sense that perhaps cities and civilization are more ephemeral than we're often inclined to think they are. Oh, yes. Um, right. The point about the Indus civilization is that you are unashamedly here dealing with a rural society. And uh, one of the most striking things, for example, about Egypt, too, is that even very prominent citizens maintain close ties with their home villages, kin ties. Mm -hmm. And one of the most powerful things in early civilizations were, in fact, the ties of kin, as they were in Katalhoyuk, in other hunter-gatherer uh, and peasant societies. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that rappers uh, in the civilization thrived was because it was rural. Because if there was trouble in a city by a part, you just moved to your village. Mm -hmm. so, right. um, and you don't get that same flexibility really in other societies. You certainly don't get it later when there were more people. And when you're talking about a city like, for example, Ur, Mm -hmm. Talking about maybe 20,000 people, if that. Mm -hmm. Right. That's very much easier to disperse. Right. Than that. Because an early Mesopotamian city, in the final analysis, was an agglomeration of different groups of villages who had ties of kin or ties of activity and whatever. Mm -hmm. and that is the. Uh, yeah, you're looking at societies which were very diverse, very tied to the land. Yeah. A very 
their ties with authority were loose. They had to be to survive because their well issue was how do you live from one harvest to the next? Mm -hmm. I gave this lecture in Arizona, which I've given before, which begins with a description of the planting and harvest of a plot of sorghum in the Zambezi Valley, which is a brutal environment down in the lower valley. And an awful lot of this chapter, this story, isn't about what they did. It was about the waiting, waiting for rain, waiting for the crops to grow, how you handled malnutrition and hunger. Mm -hmm. Because what I saw there, malnutrition of children, I've never forgotten. And you're dealing with something that's very alien to us. And an awful lot of the reality of early civilization was like that. You got a major flood in the Nile, it wiped out entire villages, not just their land, but the village itself. Mm -hmm. And if you had a drought for more than one or two seasons, and there was one in 2100 BC where contemporary reports talk about people walking across the Nile, that water was low. And the whole Nile agricultural economy depended on the rising of the water. And you have this myth, ah, oh, it was always wonderful. Ah, ah, mm -hmm. a capricious river. And you had the Pharaoh who was said to have power over the flood. Mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. And uh, it's much more complicated than that. And yeah. uh, Egyptian peasants then and now have no illusions whatsoever. They can't. Um, what, do you, what do you think about of, you know, what do you think these, um, what kind of a message do you think this gives to our civilization as far as adaptive strategies? Would you, would you just go so far as to say, yeah, it has some, some uh, applicability to our times, what Mohenjo Daro is an example of? It has high relevance. The problem is, to get people to focus on it. Mm -hmm. Number one, some of the best defenses against climate change are local. Right. Look at the place I live, precautions against flood. They're doing it, thank God. Mm -hmm. uh, look at Bangladesh. I went to a fascinating lecture some years ago by a retired major general in Bangladesh was, was at the time in charge of basically security. And most of Bangladesh is 38 feet above sea level. And he is concerned about the future in 50 years, not now, 50 years, as to how many million people are gonna have to move because of contaminated, overexploited groundwater where seawater was coming in. And where were those people going to go? And this was an extremely sobering thing to listen to. And you've got that kind of thing going on. And a lot of all this about migration is ultimately my climatic migration. Mm -hmm. Do we do anything about it? Not much. Because a number of reasons. One, we live in our own little enclave. And the climate change issues here are very different to the ones even 30 miles inland. Mm -hmm. The only universal one we have is drought, which they're working on here. But then you've got um, the other variable, which is politicians. And the problem with politicians is that they have no interest in anything except the next election. Mm -hmm. Mark you, I'm being a little sweeping here. but. Mm -hmm. Sure. Is, but if you're looking at strategies for climate change, like for example, the Netherlands, you're looking at what's going to happen for our great grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I hate to say it, but we need to think about that. Yeah. Because a lot of decisions we make now about the height of piers or water that's been, or ground that's been reclaimed, is it going to be reclaimable? And, 40 years when it's 50 foot higher. 
Mm -hmm. We're gonna, we've had some very high tides here lately, and they're flooded parts of the harbor and things like that. But nobody's asking the fundamental question: What are we going to do about this? What are successes in a hundred years? Mm -hmm. Because rising sea level is going to make it even worse. So. A lot, for a lot of this is local, and a lot of it needs very long-term thinking, at mm -hmm. which the Dutch excel. They have done a fabulous job. I mean, they've been defensive, defensive coastal works around the Netherlands for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And there was a big storm a couple of years ago in the North Sea. Immediately, they were studying weight. They're looking at floating neighborhoods, things like that. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, they're now beginning to get a little bit of objection from taxpayers saying, why are we paying for this? Surely our successors pay, which is a short sighted view. You see, we're human beings. Mm -hmm. We are the current stewards of the earth. Mm -hmm. We better start looking at this further than ag industrial agriculture. Because right. a hell of a lot of people live close and Deforestation is a classic example. And we aren't looking at that seriously yet. Nor will we until people think they're going to die if they don't. And that's not here yet. Which, in a way, ties to that sense of our relationship with ancestors that you were speaking about, that traditional societies have that's so innate. And it's potentially could tie into some of our break of awareness and identity is creating that discontinuity and good stewardship due to a lack of relationship right. with ongoing evolution on the planet. We're not, we, we're not so much socially thinking about um, ancestors or next generations as much as previous time periods were. Yeah, and the other thing is, is going on is that we're awfully, I'm getting awfully tired of people saying, oh, climate change, humans are changing, but we don't see the change. That's not the point. The point is the length of time. Mm -hmm. You have to look at the long-term view. Right. This is hard for us. I mean, we, it's not easy um, because we live in a society that are full of want instant gratification. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. This cannot be solved that way. One of the most interesting things is in archaeology is that a number of people now, increasing number, are looking at archaeological stuff in close collaboration with Native American societies. Mm -hmm. Southwest, particularly, they're really doing some very useful work um, reconciling. Native American views of history with our own. Mm -hmm. And also other people now it's become fashionable to do archaeology in communities. Trouble is they really haven't thought about what the communities are. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a very fundamental question. Yeah. So really archaeology is changing and there's the usual talk about everyone more inclusion, blah 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 blah. That's not the point. The point mm -hmm. is that we better start learning about things that our ancestors learned and used because many of them are quite simply priceless. Right. And what that leads me to another question I wanted to ask you. What would you say are the foundational insights from history that you would want to share with people? Number one, very simple. We all human beings. We all think, speak, plan look ahead, have feelings, have emotional reactions. And I think what we need to celebrate and really understand is the astounding diversity of human societies and yet how similar they are. And one of the things that I found very striking when I first came here was just how little my students knew about even people living outside California, or the McDonald's on the corner. And I spent my career here talking a lot about 
Angkor Wat and these sort of things. Mm -hmm. I hope I changed a few people's lives. You can't look at life provincially anymore. Mm -hmm. We're connected. We've always been connected. So I think the most important thing the past teaches us is that human behavior doesn't change all that much. Human reaction doesn't change all that much. But there were rich dividends for everybody if we look into the past and into the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's not like anything new, but it's absolutely fundamental. We forget this. Yeah. We burn about human diversity. We don't do much about it. And a lot of its language you can go on ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what what do you think um what would be good for people to be learning to be literate in these different knowledge areas that we're going to need to build up in order to address the issues of our times? That's a hard one because you're right up against the educational culture. Mm -hmm. The educational culture in this country is heavily oriented towards Western civilization, the glorious colonists and pioneers, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. What we've actually got to do is teach people about how messy humanity is. <laughs> it's diversity. It's yep. complexity. Yep. Yep. Because unless people have that sort of view, you're not yep. going to change racism or anything. That yep. to me is the most fun. And the textbook culture is so closely governed by the curricula, and the curricula are governed by the textbooks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wrote seven textbooks, and I'm now ashamed of them. They're good, they do the job, but they don't do the job they really should, partly because no one would have used them. Mm -hmm. I don't think they would even now. Well, what do you what do you mean by the job they really should? What could you elaborate on that a little for me? Yes, I mean, for example, a book on human prehistory should certainly explore climate change in much more detail, and it should explore certainly the impact of humanity on the environment. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah. yeah, and it should do the same with diversity. Yeah. Human social diversity, we tend to ignore it. Mm -hmm. And we tend to say, oh, the 1950s people were awful to blacks. I'm sorry. Go back to Roman times. Go back to slavery. Go back to Egypt. Yeah. And the other good things that happened as well. Yeah. But, oh, no, we have to place everything in the context of today. And today's view of humanity is flawed, seriously flawed. Do you know, do you know this guy's work, uh, James Scott? That's, that's a, that was the book I mentioned before. Uh, yeah. Habits, that's a good book. Right. Oh. This, he, he has a lot of really powerful insights that I hadn't learned really anywhere else about the relationship yeah. you're saying no. about slavery and about how much it was part of early civilizations in order to fuel much of their enterprises. Right. The, the Greeks, the Romans. Right. Everybody. I think they made life work. He gave a number that I found astonishing of the percentage of slaves that made up the Athenian population, which was somewhere, oh. yeah, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 60%. Um, stunning. When you realize, especially as a student in the classics, I find those things not to be, doesn't give me I guess it does give me some chagrin, but it also just helps me to have an understanding of why as a, a, a sort of lay scholar and thinker, it, those, those are important and they need to have some qualifiers put around them as far as how we characterize, um, oh, you know, yeah. classical civilizations. There's I just talked about this. Classic. It's part of my work on Greek hunting. I came across this literature on Greek vase painting and hunting scenes in Greek vase paintings. Mm -hmm. oh, the scholarship is superb, but obscure. And mm -hmm. Live on this very narrow trajectory. And I realized right. 
a lot of academic life is like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And water in ancient Athens, they would never have survived or Rome without slaves. Just aqueducts. Constructing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I could, I could hang out and talk like this with you all day, but I don't think <laughs> keep you a lot longer. But I did want to ask you some stuff about um, the discipline that I work and teach in of permaculture. And I wondered if you had come across it as a term, if you had any familiarity with it. Only no. enough, my wife had. She, she'd heard of it. Yep. It's sustainable agriculture, basically, isn't it? It is. It kind of, it's a little broader than that because it's more about addressing the industrial civilization challenges that we have. It focuses on industrial agriculture, but it also talks about energy and waste and buildings and infrastructure. So it's it's like a generalist systems theory about redesigning industrial civilization to avoid basically a lot of the inequities and um, you know legacies that it's leaving and started as a response to seeing the instabilities of those in the 70s, mainly came out of Australia, but it's estimated that it's taught now in 152 countries around the world. And I've been teaching it in New York City for about 14 years. And that's an unusual setting to teach it in because it's largely associated with back to the land, rural movements. But the theme that I've worked on a lot that's apropos the perspective of what was working for Mohenjo-Daro as an adaptive response is this creating more of a regional master plan for city to country fingers that connect high density urban epicenters oh, yeah. areas you know looking at green belts like we see around Stockholm like we see around Amsterdam and borrowing those ideas and saying to planners and designers in the states hey we should take some cues from other countries about what does good design look like and what does a resilient infrastructure look like and that's something i've been teaching about for more than a decade and thinking about what are viable adaptive strategies and i found your books and your writing to be a huge help to deepening the backstory on what permaculture already kind of takes as an analysis which is desertification deforestation salinization, these legacies of civilization have a long history that predate the new and added challenges of industrialization and ecological overshoot. And when we add those to it, we've got a lot of work to do to begin to really intelligently respond to what, what the human condition is in the present era, right? No, I agree. And uh... And over, I'm glad you found my stuff relevant. An awful lot of this is going to come from the developing world as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, because Bill Mullison, the founder of Permaculture, what I'll do is I'll send you, there's some really, I think, well done historic films that the BBC did that I'll send you some links to that I think you'd like, where they're following Bill Mullison around to different sites that they did these design approaches to throughout the world. And it's called the Global Gardener. Um, but what I wanted to to get into as we start to wrap up is talk a little shop about some of the permaculture kind of palette of solutions that ties into some of the themes that we've been talking about, which is this one of the ones that permaculture really gets into goes back to a book written in 1924 called, here's another book called Tree Crops, J. Russell Smith. A permanent agriculture. He's a professor at Columbia University in 1924, and he's writing about how Corsica grows most of their staple cereal grain through chestnuts that they've planted over most of the island. And a major theme of Russell Smith and of permaculture is that an adaptive strategy is to begin to create more of a perennial based food system that incorporates more plants like trees and woodies that can often weather droughts for longer time periods, as well as animal husbandry. And so there's a focus that begins to say, not to an extremist degree, let's abandon annuals, 
but there is a strong emphasis conceptually and design wise in permaculture in regards to farming systems on earthworks, water infiltration and water systems, the robust ecosystem services that we know forests perform, and then increasing the potential uh, potency of what forest ecologies can do by creating human forests like we see throughout many um, you know, traditional societies. There's lots of evidence with the terra preta and um, you know, in the Amazon where you probably are familiar with um, some of uh, Charles Mann's works. You know, Charles Mann wrote a book called 1491. This one I particularly like 1493 because here he goes into how the crops from the Americas really created this kind of early on globalized economy also where I did learn a lot about early examples, earlier examples of exploitation that I hadn't realized the full depth of the roots that go on with those um, historical issues that we're faced with. Um, yeah, what I'm referring to there in particular is Spain's involvement with um, mining in the uh, South American, um, so, yeah. exactly, um, Pelosi and those places. Um, so, so this idea of trees, earthworks, and water systems and animals that are human designed is part of the permaculture kind of palette of remedies, so to speak, that are informed by a historical point of view. And just also to, to wrap up this kind of tangent I'm going on here, um, a big part of how I teach when I teach permaculture design, which is basically the course that people consistently sign up for as a freelance educator with nothing other than a website and no institutional affiliation at all, I manage somehow to market my own programming and get enrollment and support myself through this discipline that many people don't even know what it is. Like, what is permaculture, right? And so it's a very interesting world to be in as an educator because yeah I've taught I taught for 10 years at a high school I've basically made education the focus of what I do with this permaculture content and teaching people about it because we're in a time period where I think being a good student of history and being a good student of science from a more curious viewpoint about what does it have to offer us in terms of insights about what's worked and what hasn't in the past, and what are real viable strategies for us to begin to fast track as we adapt and adjust for the future, right? Oh, well, it's human behavior. Yeah. We're and I, human I like hearkening back to Herodotus saying in the first book of the histories, he says the purpose of history is to learn from our mistakes. Oh, very true. No, it's fascinating. The trouble with any former university, for which one the publish or perish, culture's dead as a dodo. Do you mm. tell universities that? Oh, no. They won't change. They're too comfortable. And that's the trouble with a lot of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you're absolutely right. No, I agree with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Brian, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to meet with me and, and talk about these subjects and really just such a pleasure to, to at least meet you virtually. And, and Actually, get to... no, I've learned a lot too, so that's good. When I, I'm going to share some of these. There, I think you'll find a project that this guy John D. Lou did in the Lowest Plateau called Greening. The, it's called uh, Hope for... Uh, Hope for a Future, that's a fascinating epic scale uh, reclamation project that the World Bank funded to try to you know, save face as the World Bank, which they have plenty of egg on their face for things that have happened under their funding throughout the world as far as industrialization. This is an example of something they did trying to kind of swing the pendulum the other direction where they do this very large scale earthworks reclamation project in the lowest plateau that I think you'll find it really was. interesting. It did. And they do a really great documentation of it to show exactly how it, how it worked to improve farmers' harvest, to improve people's health. And overall, you can, you literally see it in the 
visual appearance of people who live in that area over the 10 year time period. Smiling. Yep. What matters is the result. Yep. It's fascinating. And that the one. Results, you'll get everyone behind you. Yep. Yeah. And a lot of these things, the proof of concept is kind of there. It's more of, I think, a matter of getting these ideas out there, which I feel you do so well in forms that people can access, understand and get and get inspired by. You know, it's a, it's such an important part of what I want to share with you about your work that I so appreciate is the accessibility and the your 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 approach is to you don't belabor things or turn it into what to me can be often an academic exercise but rather much like this tradition of permaculture which you said you'd never even heard the term you know it, your approach to how you tell history is very just so aligned with the way this community of permaculture that I work in approaches history, which is an approach that says, can we have a conversation about what the insights are that are yielded from looking into the deep past of who we are and, and where we've come from? What's what's that our actually was my reaction when I looked up what it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Makes me feel better. <laughs> well, and I'd I'd love to stay in touch with you and find some ways for us to potentially, you know, work together if there's opportunities for me to maybe have you guest teach on a topic sometime, if you'd be willing to come into a permaculture class. Maybe maybe. A lot of warning. Yeah, lots of warning. <laughs> Absolutely. And no, like, I'm, I'm like you, I'm an independent scholar. Yeah. I have to raise every cent I make. Oh, yeah. I would definitely compensate you. Oh, no, no, I'm not talking about that. But in fact, I appreciate that. But it, people don't understand the financial economics of doing what we do. Yeah. They don't. And, and please feel free, you know, to tap me as well. If something comes to mind where you'd just like to talk or have my insights oh, yeah, or... I will indeed. But I mean, I'm not, I'm not taking anything much new on now. Yeah. Because I'm so busy with hunting. But I've got, I'm a constant stream of stuff coming through here. Well, even people who you might meet who say, oh, you were talking to a permaculture guy. Maybe he could help me with the water. You come out to the West Coast. Yeah, here. Let me know. Yeah. OK, great. Because I'd love to visit and just have a cup of tea and talk in person. Yeah. I mean, if you come to L.A., I can come down. Awesome. But other than that, I'm staying fairly close to home. Nice. Six is not as nice as it sounds. It's uh, your mobility begins to lose. You lose a bit. Mobility. I still bicycle 100 miles a week. That's awesome. You didn't look like one of those big fat people who watch television. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, you live yeah. in hmm? you live in a great climate to be out biking regularly. It's a major bicycling town. Yeah, big here is the cost of real estate. Mm -hmm. Astronomical. Mm -hmm. Thank God I bought this house. 35 years ago, before the prices went up, I paid $235,000, three quarters of an acre in a house. Today, I'm told it's worth three million. Wow. But well, in human terms, it's nonsense. Yeah, exactly. Nonsense for me and nonsense for society. Yeah. yeah. This is another big issue. It is. It's one of the latest projects we've created is a permaculture land trust that's a 501c3 because I do want to begin to have at least a small role in starting to cap land values when it comes to land access for farming. It becomes a real issue when we think about as a society, what's the access issue for these growers that we'd like to have beginning to come into our landscapes? How do we help people farm in a place where land is cost prohibitive. Oh, very true. Yeah. And then of course you've got here the additional issue of marijuana farming, which is another whole other I know it's they gave really it's given a bad name to what could have been a more interesting phenomenon. Oh, yeah. culture. Yeah. It just made it an industrial nightmare like so many other cash crops. It doesn't have any other characteristic to it than cash crop economies have throughout money, money. money. That's all yeah. that's all it's driven by. And On that's a depressing note. I think we should leave it at that. Yeah, well, I agree. 
I think the industrial system it can be a real rabbit hole as far as solutions. We know what they are, and it's a matter of continuing to work on them and articulate them. So, well, well, well Brian, I'm going to send you that review. Thank you, and I'm going to send you some. If I still have a copy, which I think I do. Please, please do. I would really like to read that. I, I agree with you. I think they did some great research, and it was very thesis driven in terms of their narrative. Um, yeah. And one of course, one of the authors died. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, David Graeber, shortly yeah. after he came out. Yep. You ever met him? He wrote other, no, but he wrote other books called Thousand Years of Debt. And I know that was kind of his first dive into that kind of history that he had done. A provocative gentleman. Yeah. Very smart and very provocative. Yeah. Right. I never met him. But I haven't had any reaction academically from anybody about our review. So. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I, I look forward to reading it. Well, I think a lot of views are still going to come up, but ours was published um, in a journal called, well, I forget what it's called, but not very really well known. But mm -hmm. it's been better, you know. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any abuse yet, but I'm sure it will turn up. Well, I'm, I'm working on finishing up my own book that when I get it done, I'm going to send you a copy of just for your interest. I'd love your feedback on it. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm going to thank your wife for my her help. Yeah. Setting up. No, it was the muting. The, this loudspeaker for some reason doesn't work. Oh, this this has been great. I really appreciate your taking the time. Well, I've done nine podcasts this year for various people, and this is much more fun. Oh, great. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Good. Well, yeah. have a good day, my friend. You too, Brian. Stay in touch, please. Really. Feel free to tap me for anything. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have Bye -bye. a good day. Thanks for your work. Oh, it's all fun. Yeah. Yeah. See you me, sir. Okay. Be well.